Thank you for being here. I invite your attention to Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> We're going to begin to read at verse 37. We've been dealing with the uh, parables. He's told uh, one parable already. Uh, it's been a whole shift in his ministry. And he's begun to speak in parables. Uh, not to hide, not to conceal, but to reveal. And to make it plainer. And to make it so irrefutable to make it so penetrating that the story would get into the mind and the hearts of those who are hardened, the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel, and it would just dwell there and eat at them, and at the strangest moments would truth would spring forth into their lives, and they would see what really is true. And so he tells parables. The second parable, first parable is kind of a Moving into it, the second parable, along with the rest of them following through the chapter, is all about the kingdom. And you'll notice that each one of them, like verse 24, this parable we're dealing with, the kingdom of heaven is like, and each parable begins with that then, where the first one does not. This parable of the wheat and the tares has no question about it because there is an explanation given by Jesus. So there's no wiggle room, there's no adjustment, there's no, well, that's your opinion, this is mine kind of thing. It's straightforward. Jesus gives his own explanation. And it begins in verse 37. And before we do that, I'd like to bow in prayer. We have a fellow pastor here tonight from Millersville, and I wonder if he would pray for us. Father, our hearts are so blessed to be in this place just to worship with God's people. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Please, Jesus, please. Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus, please. Amen. Amen, amen. Uh, look uh, with me at the uh, explanation, verse 37. I want to read through that again. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, for the last several Saturday nights, we've been dealing with the issue of the tares. We dealt with the issue of the sower, we dealt with the issue of the uh, wheat, and uh, now we come to a more negative approach, in my mind at least, and I want to make it as positive as we can. Uh, we've been dealing with the tares. We've been trying to find out exactly who the tares are, and what their role is in all of this, and what their content is, what makes up a tear, and that way I can tell whether I am one. Although as a kid I was called a tear, but I... That's beside the point. So, uh, I want to be sure whether I am one now or not. And as you get into this, there seems to be only one passage, one part of the passage that really describes the tear. Of course, he gives the idea that they are the sons of the wicked one, which tells a whole story in itself. But when you come down to verse 41, which is the verse we've been dealing with, he says, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, which obviously is a direct reference to the tear idea. And so we're taking that verse and trying to analyze the depth of that verse to discover exactly what the content of the tear is all about. Uh, we have broken that down into the word offense, uh, the idea of property. What is the content of the tear itself. 
And it's all contained in the idea of offense. We discovered in that 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 is a state. In other words, there's no description of anything that they do. It is a total reference to who they are. And we discovered that a tear in the Jewish Talmud is a really was a wheat, started out as a wheat, but in the process of growth, there was a twisting that took place, which Jesus explains was as a result of the devil, the evil one. So a twisting took place in the process of the growth. That was why when they were planted, they looked like a wheat because they were a wheat. They were a legitimate wheat. But in the process of growth, there was a twisting that took place and the poisonous nature began to dwell in them. And as it grew, the poisonous nature grew and, of course, came to full fruition and there was nothing to do with the poisonous wheat now, which is now a tear, but to burn it. Uh, so the content of the state is directly related not to activities. Well, I hope you get this because we talk about this all the time. See, I could straighten up all my activities and still be a tear. Because it isn't about activities. It's about inward condition. And the essence of Christianity is not about doing certain activities. Our goal is not to get you to quit certain things or to start certain other things in terms of activity. Our desire, our heart's cry is that there would be a divine action of God within the human life and what's inside would change. That's the passage. So there is a state that he is talking about in the content. Also, there is the sequel which is involved in those whole content. Because obviously in the passage, verse 41, the whole emphasis is on that offend. And we discovered the Greek word is scandalon, which is a stick in a death trap, which has to do with how you treat others. Wouldn't it be interesting if all of Christianity is involved in how you treat others? And that there is no, well, I just do what I want to do and it's my private business. There is none of that going on in life at all because there is this constant influence upon others. So you are not just going to be held accountable for what's inside of you, but what's inside of you affecting others. That's all in the passage, and we talked about that. There is also the strain in relationship to the content. And what the tear is doing to others has to do somewhat with the wheat. It messes up the wheat. And do you realize that the final result of all this, this is phenomenal, the final result of all this is everything that offends and hurts others is going to be removed. And when that takes place, the wheat is going to be turned loose. Woo! And it's going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. So you would glean from that that we're being hampered now. But one day we will not because it's all going to be removed. Uh, Paul wrote about the whole earth is groaning under this curse of sin. But one day, one day, whew, you think I'm good looking now, you just wait. <laughs> it's going to be something, folks. It's going to be something to be turned loose. Wow, to be turned loose and just whew, with no hampering, no hampering. Wow, that's something of the content. Last Saturday, we dealt with the practice idea. That was the property, the content. But also contained within the verse is this practice idea. And you'll note it says that they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, obviously referring to the tear, and those who practice. Now, we discovered again the state. 
See, it's, it's always back to that. There's a state, which is in the Greek word practice. It's the idea of, it's the Greek word poieo, which we talk about all the time around here. And it's a state, it's, it's the word that's used for trees bearing fruit. So we're not talking about the fruit now, we're talking about the tree. We're talking about the nature that's within the tree. So the practice idea is that you have an inward state that's producing something. Which brings you to the second idea of that, which is the showing idea. Because what's in you is always showing out. You cannot contain it. What you are inside is going to demonstrate itself. You cannot stop it. You can discipline yourself. You can slap your hand. You can bite your lip. You can count to ten. You can put a cork on it. You can try to get it under control. But sometimes, someplace, you are going to explode. And what you are inside is going to be all over the place, and we will all know. Because you can't hide it. I hate that. Because my wife says, what's wrong? I say, nothing. But it shows on my face. That what's going on inside of me shows on my face. And you'd think by this time I would have learned to fake it. But what you are inside always shows itself. So what's the conclusion to that? Oh, could Jesus do something inside of me that would so radically change me that what's inside of me would come out and it would be him, which is what I want which is what I want. So in this practice idea that he gives in verse 41, there is this state of, that's in, in us that's constantly showing itself, and it shows itself according to the scheme. Now, the scheme is the idea of purpose. See, there is a purpose in all of this because as you come to the, en- the end of this uh, uh, explanation, which is verse 43, the purpose is that the righteous will shine forth as the sun. So all this time, wheat and tares, there is this divine purpose. Well, what's the problem with the tares? they missed the purpose they missed the purpose and man you can't you don't you no, you, you dare not miss the purpose Amen. that God has designed you for a purpose you don't want to miss that I'm begging you tonight think about that one see this is more than just go through the day this is divine purpose purpose that fulfills your life and you don't want to miss the purpose so what is the purpose discover it in him which brings us where we are and want to talk about tonight it is the position and this moves us to the word lawlessness so he says they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness now that didn't do a lot for me this lawlessness stuff it's the greek word anomia and it starts again with the idea of the state lawlessness is a state it's not the absence of the law it is the violation of the law in other words lawlessness is taking a law and absolutely violating it, doing the opposite of it, breaking that law. And when you've done that, you are called lawless. That's lawlessness. So again, it's not the absence of the law, lawlessness. It's not the absence of the law. It is the violation and the breaking of, of a law and note this it's not a subjective law that you and I have made up for our own convenience I have laws that I've made up and why did I make them up I made them up for my own convenience for instance I made a law I will not get up until 9 o'clock in the morning why it's my convenience are you getting it so you and I have made laws for ourselves 
which have nothing to do with law law, but have everything to do with our own convenience. We're not talking about that law because my wife makes me break that law all the time. <laughs> this is a tough crowd, brother. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, that is so true. So, back to the subject. <laughs> so, lawlessness, it's not the absence of the law, it's the violation of a law, and it's not the violation of a law that you made up for your own convenience. And it's interesting that this Greek word that we're dealing with, anomia, is a word that's used consistently in the New Testament for divine law so obviously in our passage it is referring not to my law but for divine law when I was uh, coming through the ranks this would have been what back in the 80s uh, 1800s I guess 1880 but anyhow uh, the big deal was situational ethics probably never heard of it but situational ethics was hitting the theological world and everybody was talking about ethics right and wrong based upon what? The situation. That what determines whether a thing is right or wrong is the situation. That means that sometimes it would be right, sometimes it would be wrong, and that there are no absolutes. So you can't come along and say, it's abso adultery is absolutely sinful. You can't do that. Why? Because it all depends on the circumstances. There would be some times when a wife is cold and offish and maybe she's gone off and blah, blah, blah. Then, hey, it would be quite proper to commit adultery because the situation demanded it. Therefore, you lying. You can't say lying is always wrong. Why? Because... <laughs> There's situations in which you have to lie. Well, who's going to determine what situation in which I should lie? Well, I am. <laughs> I'm going to determine that. And then immediately they would bring up the, the guys who smuggled Bibles into Russia and lied to get it done. Oh, see, they lied. It was situational, so it was okay. And there are no absolutes. So anything is up for grabs according to your situation but ladies and gentlemen when you come to this the whole idea of lawlessness you come back to there are some absolute fundamental down to it absolutes that God has written into the fiber of your system and into the structure of the universe that are not bendable and are not according to situations and not according to your convenience that are absolutely fundamental. And when they are broken, there is chaos in the life. Amen. And if you want to say, well, what, what laws are those? Well, we could talk about Ten Commandments and that would be fine. But what you discover is there are laws that God has written into the fundamental of your inner heart and life. And you have them, and I have them, and everybody has them. And any place, anywhere, under all circumstances, people have them. Why? Because they are innate to the human life. Sociologists tell us that every tribe, every group of people, regardless of how remote, regardless of how disconnected from the world they are with no communication. Can you imagine going in and discovering a people group, a tribe of people who've had absolutely no communication with any other group of people and finding within that culture, within that society, the same kind of things that we have going on? Worship. A sense that when I kill you, I've done a wrong thing. That untruth and telling it isn't right. That integrity matters. That sleeping with my brother's wife isn't the thing to do. Well, where did that come from? I'm telling you, there is a divine God who's written that into the very structure of your system. 
In other words, what I'm trying to convince you of tonight is, it's not a matter of, well, I don't know. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, I've never studied the Bible. Don't care. Well, I've never gone to Bible college. Don't care. Well, I don't listen to the preacher. I noticed that. <laughs> and I care about that. But when it comes down to it, whether you listen to the preacher or not, whether you know the Bible or not, whether you've gone to Bible college or not, whether whatever, 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 God has stamped within your system, within your very being, these awarenesses. His law. What are you going to do with that? And lawlessness is violating those fundamental inward things. I haven't pushed that on you. That didn't come from me. Well, that's just a cultural thing that people just made up. It's a religious thing that people forced on us. It's got, it's got, no, no, no. Every culture, everywhere, anywhere, under all circumstances, that is ingrained within the human life. What are you going to do with it? What would happen if from this point on you just did what you knew you ought to do? And, of course, if I were sitting in your shoes, my response to that would be, I can't. Which is why we're talking to you about Jesus. <laughs> Which is why Jesus is telling the parables. Which is the whole deal to save us from lawlessness. In other words, we're not saying all of this so that you will be better we're not saying this so you will shape up and be a part of the church we're not we're not saying this we're saying this because you and I are incapable of being the people we ought to be outside of him first John uh, chapter 3 verse 4 is an interesting verse and you probably know the verse but he says whoever commits sin commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. Interesting, it says, for whoever commits sin, and the Greek word for sin there is harmatia, which is missing the mark. So he says, whoever misses the mark, ever missed the mark? Well, missed what mark? Has to do with the law. What law? The law that God has implanted within you. So whoever has missed the inward law that God has planted within you, whoever shot at that thing and said, whoa, I didn't pull it off. Whoever has missed the target on the inward law that God has put in your heart, you are full of lawlessness, which includes all of us. Wow. Now, note in the passage, this lawlessness is intimately connected with the practice idea. He says, those who practice lawlessness. The word practice, again, is poieo, which means comes, it comes from within. It's a nature within that bears the fruit of that nature. So lawlessness is a product of the inward nature of my being. It's in the present tense, which in the Greek language is now with continual action. So it's not just, whoop, I did it one time. Whoa, hope I don't do that again. No, it's I continually break the law that is written in the inward tablets of my heart. And he reaches out and grabs a hold of this continual idea. So I am continual. It isn't that I was lawless once. It isn't that I was lawless twice. It isn't that I was lawless three times. It is that oh, I'm always lawless. In the very nature of who I am, I am filled and practicing lawlessness this is awful isn't it because of the nature within me well what is this nature well we talk about it all the time it's a self-centered 
nature. See, I'm either sourced by him or I'm sourced by myself. See, I'm living in independence from him. And the minute I step into independence from him and the sinful nature begins to flow through me to practice the lawlessness. So what's the, what's the solution to all of this? The solution is not in slapping my hand and stopping the external showing of the lawlessness. The solution is found in the radical change of the inward nature of your being. Uh, Matthew 7. I, never, I didn't see this. I mentioned this, I think, uh, last Saturday, but I didn't get into it. I just mentioned it. I, I, didn't, I didn't see this. I don't know why I've never seen this all my life. But at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21, he gives these verses that we've quoted a lot. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. By the way, the word does there is poieto, which is a fruit thing, a bearing from the inward nature. So what comes out of me from my inward nature, the will of the Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then, this is what I didn't get. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. I got that. Always knew that. But this next, next phrase didn't, didn't dawn on me. I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, wait a minute. Here's a guy who prophesies, and he's practicing lawlessness. Here's a guy who casts out demons in Jesus' name, and he's practicing lawlessness. That's strange, isn't it? Here's a guy who's functioning in the church. Here's a guy who's preaching. Here's a guy who, and he's practicing lawlessness. Why? Because this is not contained in the deed. It's contained within the nature. It's contained within the nature. So this is why we keep coming after you to say, hey, something has to happen to the inner nature. Now, I hesitate to bring this up because some of you are going to get upset about this. But the word lawlessness is in the feminine gender. It's not my fault. You know, there's the masculine and the feminine. And the masculine idea is the concrete, the solid, the nail it down, the hey, doesn't work, kick it kind of thing. Grab a hold of it, fix it. Kind of, you know, logical approach. The feminine is abstract. See, the concrete is you take a board and you screw it to the wall and that thing's going to hold. The feminine approach is jello thrown against the wall. It just slides off. You never know. Is it or isn't it? I don't know. Can't figure it out. Are you getting mad? <laughs> now take that whole idea and bring it in here. Lawlessness. Well, I did that, so I'm lawless. That isn't the idea. It's in the feminine. It's in the spiritual realm. But let me, let me balance it out by saying prayer is always in the feminine. Faith is always in the feminine. In fact, everything that I really want in spiritual life is in the feminine. So I'm supposed to give myself to that which I can't figure out. 
So if you're hanging around saying, well, when I get Jesus figured out and I figure out all this business about what forgiveness is all about and nature change is all about and when I get it all nailed down and when I logically think it all through and get it all added up and hey, then, then, then I'll move in. You will never move into it. Because it's in the feminine. It's abstract. So God is calling you into a spiritual realm where he does something so deep within your human life that he pulls you out of the nature that causes lawlessness. And you want that. I know you do because he has put that within you to want it. (laughs) It's yours. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus.